Be advised, the following episode contains content that may not be appropriate for all audiences. This is Diary of a Nation. I'm your host, Christina Zlotnick. My podcast explores the human experience in an effort to help us better understand one another. Auschwitz is liberated in January of 1945. But life under communism is difficult. Here's part two of my interview with Kati Preston. So communism comes, you know, and I love it when people say communists are like socialists. It's a different animal. Communists are communists and socialists are socialists. I lived under socialism in Britain and I lived under communism in Romania and it's not the same animal. I wish people would be more informed, you know, instead of just calling things names. Anyhow, so the communists were pretty awful to us because my mother was considered an undesirable character because she wasn't poor enough, you know. She was an employer, not an employee. And they made her take back all her old employees, including the woman who told the police that she was hiding a child. Can you imagine having to have that woman in her house working for her? And she was working very hard. And then I was going to school, nice little local school where they were indoctrinating us, telling us that, you know, our parents are not really good communists because they haven't been brought up properly. And if any of our parents were saying anything against communism, we should tell the teacher because then they'll send people to help. So, of course, I go and tell my teacher that my mother says communism is not good. And they punish my mother by making her every Sunday go and work in the park planting different benches. And after that, my mother never spoke in front of me. <laughs> but this is what they did. They indoctrinated children to this extent. And that's, that's how it worked. I mean, they brainwashed us. They brainwashed us from, from the time we started school until we got home. And the children are very easy to influence. And it's very dangerous. And at this point, my stepfather applied to emigrate to Israel. And they only allowed people who were, I would say, lower class. And we had to send in photographs. And I remember my stepfather telling me, now in this photograph, you have to look stupid. And I still have the picture. My mother was disheveled. My stepfather had a five o'clock shadow. And I looked totally stupid. <laughs> We have the stupid picture. And we got our visa. <laughs> we got our visa. And they they sent us on a train to Constanza, which was where we boarded a ship. And we went on a ship called Transylvania all the way to Israel. And this was a ship that should have had 300 people on it, but it had a 1,000. It was packed solid. There were cockroaches everywhere. It was a horrible trip. And I remember on the way there, we were only allowed to take the clothes we stood in and each small bag of clothes, no possessions, no, no jewelry, no nothing. And I had a little gold chain that my father had given me. I was, I was cherishing that. And uh, they checked us and the woman who was checking me tore it off my neck. She didn't even undo it, she just tore it and took it away from me. And I remember crying because they took away my father's chain. It had a little something on it. I can't remember what, but they took it away. And then we got to Israel, and Israel was very poor at the time. When new immigrants arrived in Israel, they all had to live in little sort of shacks in these little camps. And my stepfather said, oh, no, we're not going to a camp. Which is the best hotel in town? He went and checked into the best hotel. And he said to me, now, you're a smart little girl. I was 11 at this time. You sit in the, in the lobby, and when you hear any language that you can speak, you talk to them and tell them what a good dressmaker your mother is. How many languages do you know? I have eight at that point, I spoke Hungarian, Romanian, German, some French, uh, and that was it, I think, then, yeah. And um, I sat in the lobby, and every time I heard somebody speak language languages that I knew, I went up to them, and I got customers for my mother. My mother made dresses for people, and that's how we lived. 
But there wasn't a lot of food in Israel then. I remember there was a lot of eggplants and something called lebenia, which was like sort of a yogurt. <laughs> That's, we ate a lot of that. And then my parents decided that I had, they had to find me a school. And the only school they could find was a boarding school, a Hebrew boarding school that I hated because I was picked on because I was the only child who couldn't speak and they were pretty mean to me. And then my parents went and rented a room in somebody's house. You know, there was shortage of housing and everything. But I wasn't allowed to live with them because they weren't allowing children at this this place. You know, the woman would only rent to two adults, no children. But I was allowed to visit weekends. So my parents found me another boarding school, which was a Church of Scotland school in Jaffa. And although it was a religious school, it was a very pleasant school because they didn't inflict it on me as such, you know. And I must say it was, uh, I, I discovered that not to be bullied, you had to make friends with the biggest bully in school and just hang behind her and then people left me alone. And I quite enjoyed boarding school and I managed to learn English Within three months, I could speak it fluently. I have a knack for languages. If I'm immersed in a language, I can pick it up in no time, although it takes me a year to learn a phone number, so, <laughs> you know, even my own. We all <laughs> so, have our strengths. Yeah, well, and weaknesses. And I, I, I was very happy in this school, and I was, I was excelling. And then the headmistress of the school told me that she would get me a scholarship to go to Edinburgh University to take English. And my parents says, oh, no, oh, no, you have to have a profession. They didn't believe that learning, she said, but you know English already. What do you want to go learn English? They didn't believe that it was important for me to have a college education. I needed to learn to dress, to dress make because that's how my mother made her living and because we had nothing and, you know, so oh, because they needed you to work. Yes, we had nothing. And, you know, so then my my stepfather was pretty much an invalid. He couldn't earn money. So my mother was earning all the money. And so I they they made me stay home and do sewing and in, in her workroom. And I remember hating it. To this day, I can I can sew. I can make a dress. I can cut a dress. I hate sewing so much that I don't sew. My grandmother, my German grandmother, wanted to be a tailor like her father, but well, was not allowed. She's a girl. Was That's not right. allowed. Oh, yes. Also, girls were. Uh, also, not only just that, but when your parents told you to do something, you did it. I mean, if your parents told you jump, you jumped. I mean, there was. I, I didn't even think of resisting. You know, I, I complained a bit, but there was no rebellion. There was no rebellion. I rebelled later. But what happened is I was I was taken out of school. I wasn't allowed to finish. You know, I had enough to go to college, but I wasn't allowed any further education. And Miss Rosie, who was the headmistress, came to my parents and said, I want to teach this child after hours, twice a week. I want her to come to me. And she taught me everything I know. She taught me history. She taught me art history. She taught me politics. She taught me ethics. She taught me everything I know today. This woman took me in hand for some odd reason, and she taught me. After school, what happened? Yeah. After that, um, I was sewing. I was sewing, and I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy at all. And then my parents decided that I should go to Paris. And that's when I went to Dior. You know, I had several very successful careers, starting in, in Israel, where I had the very first boutique. They never had one of those before. And when I lived in Israel with my parents, they decided that I should go to Paris and go and study under Dior. And of course, I didn't even know who Dior was, but I was dropped off in Paris and I was told to go and find Dior and go and work there. And I did. I did because I believed that I could do anything because my mother told me that I had incredible powers and of course I could do anything I wanted to. So I found a way of, I found out where Dior's office was and I lived in a hostel for young women. Oh, 
and they used to have babysitters from there go and work for different people. And one of the places where I babysat was one of the employees at Dior's. And I remember sitting outside his office at Dior's offices every day for two weeks. And every time he came out of his office, I'd say, please, please, please let me work here. And of course, I had no work permit or anything. But I nagged him so much. He said, OK, you can work there, but don't tell anybody you don't have a permit. And I went to work for Dior. And it was amazing. It was an amazing place. He had over a thousand employees. And he was an amazing man because he was very meek. Like all big geniuses, he wasn't showing off. I remember once waiting for the elevator and there was only one place in it when it opened and he let me go in front of him. I mean, that's typical. And then what happened is one day I, I snuck into his inner sanctum where he was looking at one of the model girls that had on one of his dresses. And he had this long sort of a stick, looked like it was gold. It was probably just metal. And he was pointing at different things on the dress, talking to the dressmakers there what he wanted changed. And he looks up and takes a look at me and he says, who are you? And I, I tell him my name. And he says, what do you want here? I said, I want to be your assistant. He says, oh, you do, do you? And he smiled at me and he says, I tell you what, I'm going to Italy for two weeks. When I come back, I'll look at your work. You do a, a, a collection of garments for me on in drawings and you show me the drawings when I come back. And I was overjoyed. And of course, I was so excited. I was doing my best work ever. And he died in Italy. And they brought him back. And I, I think I cried more at his funeral than anybody and who knows what would have happened? He might have told me, go be a butcher instead. But who knows? But I had this idea in my head that I was going to work for Dior it's if he hadn't died. And also, I didn't realize that all the people who were assisting him were all young men. He loved beautiful young men. And I didn't know that they were all gay. And I remember being very interested in some of them. I was 17 and quite pretty, and I would make myself look nice and flirt with them. To and no avail. Nothing, nothing. <laughs> Until one of the doormen, <laughs> I came downstairs and he says, don't even bother. He says, they're all gay. I didn't even know what gay people were. <laughs> and then also when I was in Paris, I met Harry Winston. That the jeweler. Was, the, yeah, that was interesting because one day I, because I did babysitting, you know, through this this organization that I was involved with. And I only ever babysat once because I was always hungry and I would always raid the fridge so they wouldn't have me back. But this time I was sent to the Ritz Hotel to meet with Mr. and Mrs. Winston. They had two sons. One was called Brucey and the other one I can't remember. One was 13, the other was 16. I was 17 at the time. And I was supposed to take them around Paris and entertain them while the parents were doing whatever. Mr. Winston was about 60, small, you know, with lots of age spots. And he had a beautiful wife, much younger than him, but also middle-aged by this time. And two very nice kids, really nice kids. And I was given $100 to go and take these children out. I couldn't believe the, my luck. And I couldn't believe that these boys would eat steak all the time. You know, they, they would have steak for breakfast. And I, so I took them all around London and we had a great time and we came back and this happened three times. And one time I was given a phone call to go to the Ritz and I get there and Mr. Winston is on his own. And I said, where is everybody? He says, oh, they didn't come today. They didn't come this time. And I said, well, then I, I'm, I'm leaving. There's nothing for me to do. And very nice to see you. And he says, no, 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 I want to talk to you. I want to, I may, I want to make you an offer. And he offered me, and I was, I was very poor. He offered me, he'd give me an apartment, a car. I could go to school, do whatever I wanted to, an unlimited allowance, as long as I made myself available to him whenever he came to Paris and I would become his girlfriend. And I was, I was shocked. I was upset. And at the same time, it was a very, very attractive offer. And I said, I want to go home and think about this. I'll come back tomorrow. And I went home and I slept with my wonderful French boyfriend. 
<laughs> I spent the night with my French boyfriend, came back the next day, and I said, I'm sorry, I don't want to do it. And he wasn't angry. He was very nice. And he says, well, what can I do for you? I said, well, I need some paint. Can you give me some money for some paint? And he gave me some money, and then he gave me a paper bag. He says, I want to do you to do something for me. I want you to take this paper bag and deliver it to a certain Miss, Monsieur Levy on such and such an address. And I said, sure. He says, but take a cab. Here's money for a cab. All right. So I get in the cab, and out of curiosity, I open the bag. And it's got a necklace, a bracelet, earrings, and 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 other bits of diamonds and 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 emeralds beautiful stuff i'm horrified i'm holding this like this i deliver it and i call him up i said why did you do this to me how how could you give this to me and how did you know i wouldn't take it he says what would you do with it anyway he says you wouldn't take it you're not like that can you believe this this happened with mr mr, mr. winston I was so disappointed because he had such a beautiful wife. And I remember asking him, I said, you have such a beautiful wife. Why would you want an affair with me? He says, you don't understand when an older man is with a younger woman, it makes them feel young again. That was the explanation. Well, but it wasn't going to benefit you. No, but it was going to benefit him. It would have been a business deal for him, but he wasn't rude. He didn't touch me, didn't paw me. You know, he was, it was a business affair for him. It was a business uh, transaction. And, you know, but I never babysat after that. Uh, they, never, they never called me again, obviously. I was horrified that I even thought about it. You know? You weren't in the position of power. And after Dior, I came back to Israel and uh, I was living at home again, and it was kind of difficult because after you've been on your own for two years in Paris, you come home and you've been given an 11 o'clock curfew. I, 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 I found it very difficult, and I was doing modeling, and I was very pretty at the time, but I was very sought after, and my parents disapproved of modeling as well, which I don't blame them. But I didn't want to sew. I didn't want to sew. And then I, I fell in love with, first it was a young man called Tommy, who was at the time a journalist. And he later became a, a television personality and, and he became a deputy prime minister. Yosef Tommy Lapid. Deputy Prime Minister of Israel in the early 2000s. But my stepfather disapproved of him because he was a poor journalist and I should marry somebody rich and they broke us up. And uh, so then I fell in love with the most inappropriate poor writer. And I ran off with him because this was my rebellion. I moved in with him, and we lived in utter poverty and great happiness. <laughs> Is he your um, my, Matmore? Yeah, he's my first husband, and he was actually an interesting character because he came from a town not far from where I come from, and he emigrated to Israel when his parents sent him out just before the Holocaust. And he lived with his uh, uncle and aunt and two cousins, and... I think he, he behaved inappropriately towards one of the cousins because he was kicked out. And at 16 and a half, he joined the British Army lying about his age. And he was stationed in Egypt. He had a very long and checkered time in the army. And then he got himself to university and he studied philosophy because that was in the afternoon because he didn't like to get up in the morning. And I was convinced that he would be the next Nobel Prize winner. And we were dirt poor. We were living in furnished rooms and being kicked out for non-payment of the rent a lot. And I remember our mattress was a, a, a sack full of, full of hay, which you had to kind of position. Not very comfortable. No, but I was, I was blissfully happy because the future was ours, you know. 
And then I remember I became a journalist because I, I needed to earn money and I decided to, to, to work as a journalist. There was a Hungarian newspaper, believe it or not, Hungarian-speaking newspaper, and I'd had a women's page in that newspaper. But it didn't pay a lot, so I decided to go and uh, talk to the editor of the biggest paper, the biggest Hebrew paper, and I went there and I I said to him, listen, you don't have a women's page in your paper. I can do it for you. And he was quite interested. And he says, and how much do you think that will cost? And I gave him a price. He said, okay. He says, now let me teach you something. I would have paid you double, but because you asked for what you asked, if you determine your own worth, it's a mistake because other people always think you're worth more. I learned a lot there. But anyway, I went and I had my women's page and it was very successful. And then I sort of branched out into politics, which I wasn't supposed to do. And I would lie my way in because in those days, the newspapers was, were actually made by hand, you know. So if you came in late and you went straight down to the basement to have your thing and you lied about it being checked by the editor, you could get anything in the paper. And I would, I would even address the prime minister. And I was very cheeky. I was 21. I mean, you know. 21, 22, you know everything. For the chutzpah. That's right. And by this time I had my first son. And I remember carrying him in a, in a, in a little soft bag. And, and you know, I wasn't breastfeeding because I didn't. And I, if I didn't get home in time to make a bottle for him, I would give him tea. He survived. You know, it's amazing how these babies are on your side. They want to live. And I was very happy being a journalist. And then one day my editor called me in because my husband, Yoram, was very left wing, very, very anti-war. He was he was he, he didn't believe that Israel had the right to occupy too many Arab houses, Arab places. And we were once going to be given an Arab house to live in, and he refused because he said that doesn't belong to us. And we were poor. We needed it. But no, he said no. He had the moral strength, but he didn't have the idea that you had to support your family as well. It, it was very strange. He loved humanity more than his family. And so the, the editor called me in and he said, you know, if you left your husband, you could do much better in the paper. And of course, I didn't leave him. But then I decided to have the first boutique in Israel and I had this wonderful fashion business and I was very successful. And the more successful I was, the more money I lost because I had no idea that you you had to double what it cost. If something cost me, say, $10, I would sell it for 11 oh. because I wanted everybody to have my dresses. And the more I sold, the more money I lost. And it got to the point where I was completely broke. And I had to leave. I, 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 I couldn't take it anymore. I was also seven months pregnant with my second child. And I remember my husband wasn't earning any money and my parents were in New York, by which time they left and went to live in New York. So I got on a plane and went to New York with my, my four-year-old and my big belly and the small bag. How did you leave your husband? Uh, I had no choice. I had no money. I, you know, the, the creditors were after me. I had nowhere to go. The, there wasn't the sort of welfare that you can go today and get get housing because you have no money. I, I, had, I had to do something. And he, he wasn't doing anything, so I did. And was I he upset? He was. He was. But he let me go. He let me go. Oh, he knew. He knew. He, he, he didn't leave me. in the middle of the night. No, no. He let me go. He let me go. And I was very upset, and I remember I ended up in New York, and I had I, I my parents had a one bedroom apartment. Where in the city? In the West End Avenue on the twenty seventh floor, <laughs> and it was very hard because they had no money. My mother was working for another company, and uh, what what happened is I went to the Jewish community for help. And they gave me all the help I needed. They got me all the baby stuff. They got me a carriage for the baby. And they even introduced me to a doctor who would help me. 
and the doctor happened to be Dr. Gisela Pearl. Dr. Pearl was best known for temporarily saving the lives of hundreds of women by aborting their pregnancies because pregnant women were often killed or exploited for surgical experimentation while alive. There's a film about her. She's very famous. I didn't know that. And she took care of me and she delivered my child free of charge. And believe me, this is happening in America, and it did happen. When she was deported to Auschwitz, she was a doctor, so Mengele, Dr. Mengele, took her as his assistant, and she saved countless lives. She also delivered one baby that they hid and managed to save. And when this woman came to America, the, the FBI decided that she was a collaborator. They wanted to jail her. And then people came out of the woodwork testifying on her behalf. So she delivered your second son. Yes. And then what else happened in New York City? In New York City, I got a job. I had no, I had no permit, but I managed to uh, talk to somebody. I, my, oh yeah, it was my stepfather was walking on the street with me, and a man came opposite, and they recognized each other. They knew each other from the camp. Wow. And this man happened to be an agent for a fashion business. And he got me in to meet the boss. It's kismet. Kismet. He got me to meet the boss. And I remember going for my job interview. This was for a knitwear factory. And the man says to me, do you know anything about knitwear? I said, of course. I knew nothing about it. What was the name of the factory? Do you remember? It was Thayer, Thayer Knits. T-H-A-Y-E-R. He had the showrooms there. And then he had the... He had the workrooms behind and he takes me in and he shows me all these big machines. And he says, you know, of course, you know. Oh, yes, of course I do. I didn't know anything about it, but I picked it up as I went along. And then he says to me, you know, uh, since you're young and, and smart and you went to Dior, come into my showroom and tell me what you think. And I walked into the showroom and it was all dark and purple and this antique mirrors and he says to me what do you think I said it looks like an old whorehouse <laughs> and he looked at me he says it does does it I said yeah he says well you redecorate it and he gave me a blank check so I redecorated the showroom and I remember I learned while I was in Paris that if you tw if you took a mirror and slanted it slightly this way it make every it makes everybody look tall and slim so when the buyers would come in and look at themselves, they felt better. I also had what was called butcher lights. So, you know, when you go to the butcher, all the meat is very pretty. You take it home and it's not the same color. I had butcher lights. So all the buyers looked very pretty and felt very good. They doubled the orders. And I was, I was, I was very appreciated there. And he thought I, would, I did a very good job. And what he did, he was traveling to Europe going from town to town, like Paris and, and London and, and Holland and places, to knitwear factories. And I had to design a, a collection while I was there. And then we went to the next one. And on the way back, I would look at the samples. And then we would import them. That, that was my job. And I remember traveling all over Europe. It was fantastic. I mean, I really enjoyed it. He didn't pay me a lot, but I didn't care because I was very happy. And I managed to leave my babies uh, at home with my, with my parents. My stepfather looked after them. But I didn't want to stay in New York because I wasn't earning enough money to be able to live on my own. I didn't want to constantly sponge off my parents. So I took my two children and got myself a job in Italy. I was in, in Milan. I was working for a company in Milan designing and I thoroughly enjoyed Italy. I couldn't speak a word of Italian and I remember uh, drawing things. I had my two children and they gave me this apartment which was completely empty and I remember I had a mattress on the floor for myself and my eldest one and a box for my baby who was seven months old and then the kids cried and I cried. We cried ourselves to sleep. And the next morning I decided, well, I had to do something about it. So I went downstairs with a notepad and I drew things that I needed. 
I went to shops and I drew tables and chairs and I managed to furnish my apartment because he'd given me some money. And I managed to furnish my apartment. But the problem was that in Italy at this time, nobody wanted to work in a home. They all wanted to work in factories and I couldn't get a nanny for the kids. So I had to take them to daycares. So And I had no car. So in the morning, I'd get up at six and take one to one daycare and take the other to the other daycare, go to work and come back in the evening and pick them up and do this six days a week. And I was exhausted. Sure. And then my youngest got very ill and he was hospitalized. And I almost lost him a couple of times. He had double pneumonia and various other diseases. And I remember one of the Italian doctors trying to cheer me up, saying, Signora, don't worry. If he dies, you're young, you'll have others. <laughs> and I was on my own at this point, and I, I remember sending a ticket for Joram to come and help me. And he came to visit me in Italy, and we decided that he would go back to Israel, and then he would come and join me. Your first husband. Yes, and that was nice because at least I had some support. And then the Italian company sent me to Portugal because they opened a factory in Portugal and they wanted me to run it. What was the name of the Italian factory? It, it was Alex Mann, Alex Mann. And then I was sent to Portugal to open a factory in Portugal. But what I didn't realize that one of the investors in Portugal was an old gentleman, an old Hungarian gentleman, and I was really sent as bait. I didn't realize that. They wanted me to marry this old man. They sent me to Portugal in order to ensnare this man so he would finance their business. But I didn't realize this. So I go to Portugal and I stay in this beautiful, beautiful sort of castle type thing in, in on one of the hills in, in Lisbon. I mean, it was an amazing place full of antiques. I mean, he had obuson hangings on the wall and unbelievable antiques everywhere. And he was living with his elderly mother. He was in his 60s. She was in her 80s. They were sharing a room, which I found a bit strange, but it wasn't my business, and they were very nice to me, and he was very strange. He was very stingy because he had a Bentley, but he drove a very old car to save gas, and they were so rich. It was unbelievable. One day, I wanted to go out on my own, and I asked for the key for the front door, and it was this big. It wouldn't fit in my handbag. It was one of the huge, old, studded doors, beautiful place. And they, and I remember having dinner with them, and they had four servants. And she takes three apples, and she says, I'm going to go and give this to the servants for their dessert. And she comes back smiling, and I said, I have to ask you a question. How do you give three apples to four people? She says, my dear... Can't you, can't you be creative? You cut each apple into four. This is how stingy they were. And of course, uh, I wasn't interested in this man. And then the mother took me aside. She says, you should marry my son. I said, why? She says, he's very rich and you would inherit everything. I said, but I have two children and I'm married. She says, you'll get divorced and don't worry about the children. There's plenty of boarding schools. Ooh, no, 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 no. So I did run the factory there without all his money, and the factory didn't have enough money. But I I enjoyed my time in Portugal because I enjoyed the people there. I learned Portuguese, and I was running the factory, and I was told that if anybody was pregnant, I had to fire them, and I didn't. And not only did I not fire them, but I established a little place in the garden where they could keep their children, and I hired someone to watch the children for them. And I'll never forget the most wonderful gift I had from one of these very poor women. She brought me an egg. That was the most that she could offer me. It was an egg. And she had it wrapped in her handkerchief. And the way she handed me this egg, it was like, like a diamond for her. You're a mensch. Yeah, it was amazing. And I ran that factory for a while until it shut down. And then I found myself in Portugal penniless. And 
I almost married a, a very nice Portuguese man who was courting me at the time. He was a composer and he worked for the television and he got me a, a, a show on the television. What's his name? Philippe de Souza. Unfortunately, he's dead now. Philippe de Souza was originally from Mozambique. He was Portuguese and he was from a very good family. And uh, he he was a real gentleman, you know. He would always speak to me in the third person. He wouldn't touch me because we weren't married. He was that kind of a gentleman. But his mother and his aunt were very much against me because I was suspect, you know, two children, divorced two children. Ah, this is bad, bad news. Did you actually get divorced? Uh, no. but From the first husband? No, but we were separated. Right. We were separated and I was going to get divorced, but I didn't tell people I was still married. And, you know, you were very suspect if you had children and no man. In Portugal, in those days, you needed a document from the from the authorities to let you out of the country uh, signed by your husband that you were able to leave. Like you're the property. Yes, that's how things were. And we've come a long way. People don't realize that. We've come a long way, not long enough, but we have. And so I lived there and I lived in great luxury in Portugal because I I, I had my television show and I had I had a maid and I had a cook and then everything fell apart. The television show was not a success. And and I remember what happened. I was in the studio. They kind of painted me up like lots of makeup. And it was raining. And it was a very primitive studio. And the rain started falling on my head. And it washed off my makeup. And I stepped out of my circle there that they drew for me. And they said, get back in the circle. I said, no, it's raining. And it went national and he fired me and here I found myself without a penny I was either going to have to marry Philippe de Souza or I was going to to somewhere else so I went to England and that's how I got to England what was waiting for you in England well uh, the people that I made friends with during well not friends but the kind acquaintances through business one of the factories that I worked for in England were looking for a designer. And that's where I went. I went to work for them. What was that factory name? That one was called Lananit, L-A-N-A. And then it became Novanit, which was the name I gave it because it was a better name. And I worked for them for a number of years. What exactly did you do there? I designed garments by this time, I knew all about knitwear. I designed knitwear, and I I was I, ch checking colors and working with the fabric manufacturing and making dresses for Marks and Spencer, which was one of the big, one of the big companies there. And I lived in London, and I had an apartment, and I finally had a car. And I remember my first car, I was 28, and I loved that car so much, I put it to bed every night in the little garage. <laughs> it was a big deal. And uh, it, was, it was a very interesting time I had there. And, of course, I fell in love with my boss, unfortunately. Yeah. And he was married, unhappily married. Of course, everybody says they're unhappily married when they're cheating on their wives. Well, I don't think Maybe we he have was. affairs when we're content. When we're happy, yeah. But anyhow, he, he, he and I had a most incredible relationship because he was a survivor too. And uh, he was from the Yugoslavian part of Hungary. You know, again, Hungary had so many different... And him and his sister survived father died earlier but his mother was deported and him and his sister ended up in Budapest and he pretended to be a Christian and befriended the son of one of the ministers a minister being a fa not, not a minister in the church but a minister in the, in the government and he was living with these people pretending to be pretending to be a Christian. And whenever they went out courting girls, he pretended to be gay because he didn't dare take his pants off. 
because he was circumcised. Only Jews were circumcised then. One of the ways they found out who was Jewish, they'd pull their pants down. If you were circumcised, you were shocked. How humiliating. Yeah. And so he had to pretend to be gay, which was fine. But at night, during the night, he would go down to the cellar and he would make false papers for people. He would take a potato and carve it out to make stamps on things. He was making false papers, saving people at night. Another mensch. Another mensch. His sister was in one of the houses at Wallenberg. You know about Wallenberg. Raoul Wallenberg was a Swedish businessman and diplomat based in Budapest. He rescued thousands of Hungarian Jews by handing out protective passports and establishing safe houses during the Holocaust. She was in a Wallenberg house, and she had an eight-month-old baby that she was cradling. Her husband was somewhere else, and there was an air raid, and when the air raid was over, her baby was dead, had a shrapnel in its head. Oh, God. I met her later in London. She became one of my best friends. She was a wonderful woman. But people lived like this. These were lives, you know. And anyway, this, this man, Fred Strasser, who was his name, was incredibly capable. And he's, he's the one who invented the, the knitting machine that is big and round, you know. Those round knitting machines you see in factory, he invented that. He was a technician as well. He could do anything. And that's how he was able to make these false papers. He was very capable and very inventive. And he eventually went to England and, ha and he became a millionaire in England, very successful in the fashion business. And I met an Englishman who was nice enough, also in the fashion business. That's how I met most people. And I married him. What's his name? Uh, Michael Phillips. And uh, I was still working for Novanit at the time, and I married him. And uh, I remember he had a company that was in receivership. Him and his mother were working together in this company that was quite old, but it was it was going to it's going to close down. And I remember leaving my job to go and work for him. And they were very much against it because they thought, well, a secure job and we're about to go broke. But I insisted and I, I muscled my way in there and I started designing garments and they were all horrified. His sister was working there too. And I started making different garments and Somehow it became very successful because it was different, you know. And at first they were horrified and they they disliked me because I was a bully. Yes, but you have to be, you know, you have to survive. And I had my 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 third child, his son at this time, and I was working full time. I was working full time during the day and then going home at night and we had au pairs and things. It was very difficult. As you know, by this time I had three children in the house. It wasn't easy. And I worked all the hours at God's sense. I, I worked all the time. He didn't. He, he, was, he was kind of working, yes, but not really, you know. And I changed things. I mean, I I started doing profit sharing and I was called a communist by his family. I stopped people having to clock in and he says, well, how do we know if they're working? I said, you come in earlier and you leave later. And we did, you know, things like that. And I lived with this for 10 years and I wasn't happy. It wasn't a happy marriage. I worked like a dog. I had everything. I mean, I was so rich at this point. We were so successful that if I wanted a car, I just looked at the magazine and said, I want that one in red, never asking for the price. I wanted the wallpaper. Oh, it's only in Paris. I flew over to Paris to get it. I had all this and it didn't make me happy. Beautiful houses, beautiful everything. I was able to give the boys everything they needed, special lessons. If they, if they, if they could sing, they had singing lessons. If they could play the piano, they had piano lessons. Didn't do any good because, <laughs> you know, you know, boys, but there you go. But it was, you know, I enjoyed I enjoyed the fashion business, but I never felt that it was important enough, you know. It it 
it wouldn't change humanity in any way. You know, I knew that, oh, yeah, it's very nice, but what difference does it make if somebody has a beautiful dress or not? You did bring a lot of beauty to the world. I, and it was, you know, I used to sell more than a thousand dresses a week. I mean, it was very successful. And my very last collection, by this time I was divorced, but my very last collection, it netted $2 million. I mean, that was that was big money then. But anyway, after about, oh, nine years, I started thinking, well, this marriage is certainly not working. And I remember my first husband came to live in in London as well, and I was supporting him because he didn't have any money. And I used to have lunches with him and complain about my marriage. And then I went to a cocktail party. I went to a cocktail party for, for the labor movement with my husband. And there I, I met an Israeli sculptress who brought this young man with who was very, very quiet. He was dressed all in black and he sat in a corner and he looked very interesting. And I, I know that if somebody doesn't say anything, they're either very stupid or very clever. You know? I didn't know which. So I said to her, who's the guy you brought? She says, ah, he's gay. Said, ah, no, he's not gay. And suddenly the so-called gay person started coming over to my house all the time. He was interested. And... I was interested, and I remember saying to my husband, I was trying to make him jealous. I said, listen, I think he's a very attractive young man, so what are you going to do about it? He says, oh, go away with him for a weekend and get him out of your system. Really? Mm -hmm. And I did. Went away for a weekend and got him into my system. <laughs> and I, I, we fell madly in love, and it was a very difficult time for me because... Breaking up a marriage with three children and the business we ran together was almost insurmountable. And Gordon said, I, I, I'll wait for a year. I'll deal with it for a year. And for a year, I saw him Tuesday nights. I was allowed to see him Tuesday nights, according to my husband's permission. He knew about it, but he thought I would get over it. And I was able to see him Tuesday nights, and I was I was in agony thinking, well, where is he the rest of the time? How can we ever have a life together, you know? And I was hoping my husband would meet somebody. And he did. He met a very nice young woman, and he ended up finally getting married to her. But he wouldn't give me a divorce, you know. And by this time, I was pregnant with my last child. I was seven months pregnant when he finally gave me a divorce because he wanted to marry this girl. And he gave me a divorce when we ran to get married. And I remember walking into the registry office. I was quite big with a big bouquet of flowers instead of my in front of my belly. And the registrar says to me, oh, are you the bride? I said, yes, I decided to make an honest man of him. Fine. <laughs> what was his name, the third husband? He was Gordon Preston. He was, he was, my, he was my last one. And that's your last name and today? Yes, and that's the one who died. And we were together 43 years. And is he the love of your life? Was I, he the love of your life? He was definitely the last love of my life, yes. How do you characterize the three husbands? <laughs> They they all had their points. I mean, Michael, the middle one, was very kind. He was a very kind. He was very creative. He had wonderful taste. Uh, he was fine. He just he, we just went a good fit. And Yoram was my teacher. You know, he was my he was he he taught me everything. After Miss Rosie, whatever else I knew was from him. And Gordon was my hero to some extent. Gordon was an interesting guy because he'd lived in Israel. I didn't know him in Israel. When I met him, he had just come back from one of the wars. And he spoke Hebrew. He wasn't Jewish. But he went to Israel accidentally. He was on a road trip with somebody he was he was uh, an en an aeronautics engineer. He was working for Rolls Royce, and he decided to go around Europe on a motorbike with a friend. And their motorbike died in Athens, and the only ship out of Athens was going to somewhere called Haifa. The other guy went home, and he went to Haifa. And when he he landed in Haifa, he saw these beautiful soldier girls. 
And he says, I'm going to stay here. <laughs> the, 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 the young soldier girls with their miniskirts were very attractive. And so he, he stayed there and he eventually ended up on a kibbutz. And he built a factory on the kibbutz. An Israeli commune. Yes. And then he also worked for the Weizmann Institute for a while. And for a young kid his age, he was in his 20s, it was a big deal. And he fell in love with Israel. He fell in love with the, the intellectual part of it. He happened to be in a kibbutz that was very intellectual. They were Czech Jews mainly. And he fell into a society where the prime minister would come and have dinner with the people and you know it was and it was a real kibbutz they had they shared everything nobody had any possessions the clothes were shared everything was shared and he he liked it very much and they wanted him to marry one of the local girls and he 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 it didn't take you know it didn't take and then the war broke out the the, the first war uh the six day war and they they said, you have to leave now because, you know, all locals have to. And he said, I'm not, I can't leave. I mean, how can I go and say, have a nice war and come back? No, I'm staying. Well, I said, well, if you're staying, you might as well join the army. And they put him in Israeli uniform. And he fought for three wars he fought in Israel speaking Hebrew. And strangely enough, all our lives together, when I didn't want the boys to understand something, we spoke Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my non-Jewish husband. He was, he, was, he was the best Jew of all of them. <laughs> this interview is being published in three parts. In part three, Kati discusses her associations with Israeli government officials and fellow Holocaust survivors, plus her current interests and her take on American politics. Do you have a compelling story? Or do you know someone I should interview? Drop me a line at diaryofanation at gmail.com. Please tell a friend to listen too. That's how we grow our audience and continue podcasting. Find Diary of a Nation through your favorite podcast app. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Diary of a Nation. Music